Um, so welcome. Uh, my name is Roger Berkowitz, and I'm the academic director of the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, this will be the last session of the semester, more or less a semester, that we've been trying to work on. And we've been reading uh, Hannah Arendt's book, uh, Rahel Von Hagen, The Life of a Jewess. Um, it's, it's chronologically Arendt's first book. Uh, it's the book she wrote um, as her uh, Habilitation under, under Karl Jaspers. And uh, it is a book she published later because she had to flee Germany uh, with the manuscript. Uh, we've told this story before. It was saved by Gershom Scholem, who sent it back to her. And, uh, and later she added some chapters and published it. Um, we've, we've now read the whole book. Uh, the last chapter uh, uh, that we were going to read for today, that we have read for today, is One Does Not Escape Jewishness. But I, and it's a short chapter. And I said at the end of the last session that it would make sense for us to um, have questions and try and set the chapter uh, within the, the, the framework of the whole book. Um, so uh, I know at least one person sent me a question in advance. Uh, that was Connell. Um, and he actually sent a two-part question. But I thought I'd, I'd start there because he asks the big questions that I was going to talk about anyway, so I thought we could frame it within his questions, and this would be an opportunity for us to go back um, over over parts of the book and and put this chapter in context. So Connell writes uh, early in Rahel von Hagen chapters one and two. You mentioned that Hannah Arendt's views on introspection. I would appreciate if you would draw the threads about this in the book together and recap, please. Okay, um, that's a big question, um, but I think it's a, it's a good place to start uh, because I think it is, I said this a number of times earlier on in, in the sessions, I think this is the theme of the book in many ways, introspection. And, um, and I thought we'd start there. So Arendt says in the preface to her book, that this book is not about Rahel Von Hagen. It's not a biography. Uh, she says in its attempt to narrate Von Hagen's life, Rahel's life, as she herself might have told it. And, um, and yet, clearly, it's also Arendt's reading of that life. And in the, in the first, in the preface, in the first chapter, uh, Arendt says that Rahel made a great error in her life. Uh, and she says that her great error was to embrace the romantic love of self over her own love of her, of her person, of who she actually was. Um, another way of, 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 of describing this error is that Arendt sought to uh, escape from being, I mean, I'm sorry, that Rahel sought to escape from being who she was. And this, of course, ties us into the last chapter, one does not escape Jewishness. Um, so to, this is important for uh, Connell's question because what Rahel sought in seeking to escape herself, her Jewishness, was to um, choose instead of her Jewishness, this great error, uh, a romantic love of the self. She romanticizes what is not real, an ideal, a version of herself that is extraordinary rather than ordinary. Um, Arendt says of Rahel that she considers herself extraordinary. She subordinated her ordinary, real person to this extraordinary self. Um, and try to give her extraordinary self a destinal uh, importance, that, that it would matter in the world. So she wanted to matter. And, and this is something that we should all keep in mind as we read Arendt in general. For Arendt, the most human need is the need to matter. It's not the need for food. It's not the need for life. This is Arendt's critique of human rights, right? It's the need to be significant, to matter. 
and uh, and Rahel didn't matter. She was a Jew in Germany in the late 18th, early 19th centuries. Uh, she was poor. She was ugly. Uh, she was ordinary. Um, and she wanted to be, she wanted to matter. I think that's why RN is so, and there's a lot of reasons RN is drawn to someone like Rahel Von Hagen, aside from the fact that we have this incredible literary uh, treasure trove of thousands of her letters and diaries that, you know, expresses who this woman was as a Jew in Germany in this period. But she's a Jew in Germany who has incredible ambition and is completely frustrated in the world. And her, her great error was romanticism. Her brilliance, if you want to put it in this way, and it's a two-sided brilliance, but it's her brilliance, was that she was brilliant at thinking. And this was, of course, what allowed her to think herself out of a real self and become this uh, extraordinary self. In the face of the harsh reality, Arendt says, of the real world in which she was ordinary and barely human, Rahel had one means of escape, which was to think. In thinking, she could transpose herself from an insignificant Jew into someone living out a destiny of significance. Thinking, as RN understands it, in Rahel was a rebellion against the cruelties of the harsh worldly reality. She says, given the absolute renunciation of the world, all that seemed left was thought. The handicaps imposed upon Rahel by nature and society would be neutralized by the mania for examining everything and asking questions with an inhuman persistence, as Arendt describing Rahel. And, you know, for all of you who've read some Arendt, which I think is most of you, you know, it's somewhat bracing, I think, to, to, to read this, because Arendt is saying that thinking is like a mania. It's like a mania that takes us away from reality. Whereas if you've read Arendt on Eichmann or in The Life of the Mind, which we're going to be reading for next session, you know that Arendt raises the question of maybe it's thinking that's the only thing that can keep us in the real world, that can prevent us from being carried away by the ideology. Um, in any case, this thinking uh, is very much along the lines of what uh, Connell refers to as introspection. It is the turning inwards into a kind of solitariness. Um, and, and this is what Arendt really found both amazing and disastrous and dangerous in Rahel, is that um, she wanted to escape being a Jew, escape her reality, and she found that in the power of thinking she could flee the world and turn inwards into introspection. Um, and thinking, she says, as it, this is in the first chapter, as it rebounds back upon itself and finds its solitary object within the soul, thinking looks inward and distinctly produces, so long as it remains rational, a semblance of unlimited power by the very act of isolation from the world. That to me is an extraordinary statement, that thinking can create an absolute, I'll use the word totalitarian, absolute power, because it's unlimited and it's isolated from the world. And this is the, the, this is the danger that Arendt sees in the romantic thinking era that Rahel um, represents. It is the unlimited power of thinking, of introspection, um, that we see in Rahel, but we also see in totalitarian politics a uh, hundred years later. Um, that thinking is without limits means that Rahel can fully divorce herself from reality and live in a fictional world, isolated from what is. And she can remake herself as she wants. And this is the true power of thinking, which includes the power to negative facts, to negate facts. 
and RN makes a lot of this line from Rahel in one of her letters, facts mean nothing at all to me, for whether true or not, facts can be denied. Right? This is very much, again, a lead into the world we live in, that Rahel is here seen as a, an epitome of, an example of. Um, if you simply think and live in a fictional world, you deny reality, you can deny facts. And so this turn towards introspection, Connell, to, to come back to, to your question, is a way to um, escape Jewishness as a fact of the world. Uh, it's the way that Rahel sought to become a, sought to become a parvenu, sought to become uh, someone who could deny that she was Jew, become an exceptional Jew. Um, and, and in doing so, uh, assimilate uh, and, and become uh, a member of a mar someone married to a, a, a court, uh, someone who works for the government who's not Jewish, and baptize herself and, uh, and escape her Jewishness. Um, we come to this chapter, the last chapter, on one does not escape Jewishness. And we have to read it within the context of the whole book, including the penultimate chapter, uh, in which uh, Arendt ends that penultimate chapter by talking about Rahel's faults. That chapter is on the, the pariah and the parvenu. And what she says in that chapter, between the pariah and the parvenu, is that Rahel tried desperately to become a par parvenu. She really wanted to give up her Jewishness and become you know, a, a new person. And she couldn't. She couldn't deny Pauline von Weisel, but in the end, she had certain, quote unquote, and Aaron puts it in quotes, faults, um, which, are, which she couldn't govern, but which prevented her from becoming a parvenu. Um, namely, uh, she couldn't give up her Jewishness in some way. She couldn't become an anti-Semite. And this, and this becomes part of the argument here of the book, that in, in order to truly assimilate, the Jew has to become an anti-Semite. You can't choose to assimilate to anti-Semitic Christian society in Germany in the 19, in the 1800s uh, and decide, well, I'm going to assimilate to it, except not assimilate to the anti-Semitic part. You either assimilate to it and you become an anti-Semite or you don't. And because Rahel had something in her that refused to become an anti-Semite, refused to reject fully Jews, she couldn't fully assimilate and therefore she couldn't escape her Jewishness. And, um, and this last chapter uh, sort of theorizes or looks at that inability of Rahel to escape. So very quickly, um, it's a short chapter. Uh, as far as I know, there's five points in it. I'll just mention the five points and, and then we can move on. Uh, the first point is that uh, Rahel desperately wanted to escape her Jewishness. Arendt says the central desire of Rahel's life is to escape her Jewishness. She says this was unfulfillable for two reasons. One, objectively, the anti-Semitism of German society in the 19th century simply didn't allow it. As much as Rahel did to assimilate, including marrying a, a, a German and baptizing herself, she would never be accepted. The society would simply not let her be a German Gentile. And so the first reason it, she couldn't escape it is the society wouldn't let her. The second reason is that um, to some degree, she wouldn't let herself. And this is the point I was just making. She has to, to assimilate, you have to feel shame at being Jewish. And, and Rahel did in some sense have that shame and she did have a kind of pride in being an exception but she couldn't take it to the extreme. She couldn't, um, in the end, see her Jewishness as, uh, 
as, as something to be denied, as an evil character trait. She couldn't internalize her anti-Semitism. So um, the desire to escape Jewishness uh, leads in the second point of this chapter to the idea of the Jew itself. Um, in a sense, the, the point here is that originally to be a Jew was to be a shared social condition. You're a Jew. And you have a history and you're out there as a Jew. But if you try and escape your Jewishness and become a parvenu, um, you deny those Jews out there, the bad Jews, but you're still a Jew. And so you become a Jew divorced from all the historical and social mishigas of being a Jew, excuse me, um, the, the, the baggage of being a Jew, but you're just a Jew. And you're Jewish, and simply being a Jew becomes the problem, not the characteristics of Judaism. And it becomes a personal defect to be a Jew. Um, and, and so you can't really give it up because Either you, you, know, you, you have to either, you are a Jew or you're not. The third point is that um, in the desire to be, escape Judaism, uh, there's a desire to be leave, to leave Berlin, to leave Germany. But wherever you go, whether you go to Paris or whether you go to Moon, the Moon, um, you're still trying to escape being a Jew and your Judaism is still important to you and you can't fully let it go. It's not something you can let it go. Um, and then I'll, fourth and fifth, I'll combine. Um, the point in the end is simply that in an, in an anti-Semitic society, you are either a rebel or pariah, or you're a scoundrel and a parvenu. You're either a scoundrel and parvenu who denies Judaism so fully that you internalize the anti-Semitism of the society, or you're a rebel pariah who in some sense holds on to your being a Jew, being a rebel, being a pariah, and resists um, the assimilationist society. Um, I think the obvious question for us to ask, I'm gonna, this is the end of the introduction, is of course relating this to other racisms today, um, whether it be um, uh, black racism or, or homophobia or Islamophobia or anti-Semitism, etc. I mean, one of the questions I think to ask is, is Arendt's analysis of assimilation, which she does here based on Rahel von Hagen in the uh, late 18th, early 19th centuries, and which she thinks is still valid in the 1930s in Germany, uh, is that still meaningful in the world today, in the United States, in America, in Europe, et cetera? So I'm going to stop there. Um, maybe I'll start with Connell, if you're on, Connell. Um, I don't know if I've answered your first question to your satisfaction. I mean, I'm trying to sort of, uh, you know, so in a sense, what I'm trying to say is that the book is about Rahel's great error, which is a great error of thinking leading to introspection and a denial of reality. But it's about how Rahel was someone who failed in her error and was saved by her faults, namely that she couldn't become a parvenu and she couldn't become fully engaged in an introspective world. And she had a sense for being real. And it's that reality, that common sense of reality that saved her. So Connell, if you're on, maybe you can respond or, or say if you wanna add something to your, to your question. Well, just a puzzle, Roger. That's great, thank you very much. So your point about uh, introspection being a way to escape her existence, her Jewishness, brings up the connection with imagination. So what I think I hear you saying is that since imagination as part of thinking can go wrong, there was something about her, her character that controlled her imagination, disciplined it, that's the word I'm looking for. It disciplined her imagination so to kept her grounded or something, I don't know. But I'm interested in the connection between introspection, imagination, and thinking in the way Arendt plays with them. Thank you. 
Uh, that's a great question, Connell, and it allows a plug for the next book we're reading, which is on thinking, uh, which will largely be about the relation between thinking and imagination um, and judgment. So, but to your question I, and to your point, I think it's a really important one. Arendt is going to, at some point, later than this book, think deeply about thinking, right? And she's going to say that one form of thinking is incredibly dangerous. And that's the thinking that leads to introspection. It's the thinking that leads you away from the world. There's another form of thinking that she thinks is the savior or the saving grace. And that's going to be what she will call, building on Kant, the enlarged thinking, the erweiterte Denkata, the widened way of thinking, where you think from as many different perspectives of others as you can, and you challenge your own limited worldview, but you don't actually, um, and in fact, it, what, what that kind of thinking does, that imagination of imagining yourself in other people's shoes, it actually reduces introspection because it widens your view of the world and brings you into a much wider and broader idea of the world um, than you could get simply thinking from your own perspective. And that's going to be the kind of thinking I mean, there's a couple of different definitions of thinking. That's one of them that Arendt will uh, engage in. Another is this idea of the two in one, um, that in a thinking, I have a conversation with myself and I constantly question myself. Again, that idea of thinking takes us out of the self-certainty of introspection and is Socratic, and her model for it is Socrates, um, in the sense that it's constantly challenging my uh, self-certainty um, that might emerge from a kind of introspective, non-worldly thinking. So she will come to another understanding of thinking, which is almost the opposite of introspection. And I think what you'll see is in her work, she sees deeply the danger of thinking as introspection. As, and she sees that, that idea of thinking emerging with the Romantic Enlightenment and she enlists Kant and, so and, and Socrates and others to imagine another idea of thinking that is against that and that um, uh, resists the, the, the temptations of introspection. Uh, Roger? Uh, the, yeah, you want to go on, Connell? You want to answer that or is someone else? Sorry, was, uh, this, uh, this is Jack. I, I, if Connell wants to speak, I'll, I'll back off. Go ahead. I would just want to say that in this chapter, um, Hannah Arendt really states that that larger mind, the great, the greater view, is comes with being a pariah. That being a pariah actually provides that enlarged view, and it's partially that that prevents uh, uh, Rahel from uh, uh, getting rid of her Jewishness. It's it's a, it's a characteristic of the pariah to have that largeness of mind. And for that reason, she cannot dispose of her Jewishness. That's, I think that's what she says somewhere to one or two pages before the end of the book. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we talked a little bit about this at the end of the last session. It's maybe you're seeing it somewhere else. I thought it was at the end of the, between pariah and parvenu chapter, but maybe you have another section as well. But in that chapter, she says that um, Rahel, um, her faults kept her from becoming a real parvenu and that what it offered her was um, a view of the whole. Um, and that this view of the whole, because you are a pariah, you're, you're kept out of the assimilated mainstream society and you can look at it with a kind of impartiality. And I, I said last session, this is something that, this is very much how Arendt understood herself. When Arendt talks about being a conscious pariah, what she says is that 
in order to think deeply and rightly about the world, you have to look at the world from an outsider's point of view. You have to look at it and have a view of the whole. And you can only really do that if you consciously deny yourself success in the world. You can't be successful and be a great thinker. Now, I'd like to, you know, we can talk about that. But for Arendt, I think she takes that very seriously. Um, if you are successful and you, and you, you become, uh, in a way, a spokesperson for the world, um, you lose your impartiality. You lose your view of the whole. Uh, you have to, in some sense, always stand as an outsider. Um, and, uh, you know, there may be reasons at some point to become successful. Uh, but, but she thinks then you lose that outsider uh, impartiality. Um, Connell, did you want to add anything before we go on? Just a question, Roger. When you were saying about um, Arendt's warning about thinking as introspection, I was thinking about the current situation in business organizations and management, where basically everybody is being told to be reflective, to practice reflection, to be better leaders, managers, all sorts of things. So is Hannah Arendt giving a warning? Is she rejecting the notion of reflection as generally meant in management literature, business literature, and all that. And I'd be really interested, and if she is, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, you would have to look at the literature, but I, I certainly don't think what they mean by being reflective is going to be what she means by it. Um, I mean, she doesn't use the word reflective. Um, yeah, I, I, I highly doubt that... Uh, the business management uh, vocabulary relates to what she's talking about, which is really to um, think from so many different people's perspectives and then make a judgment. Maybe it is. I, I don't know. I, I'd have to. You'd have to tell me a little bit more about what that what they're saying. Roger, can I yeah. answer a bit of that? I have a question. Uh, let me just make sure Connell doesn't want to respond. I mean. Oh. No, just, I mean, even this morning, an email from the Harvard Business School yeah. saying, you know, tips tips <laughs> of the day says that you, you sit and reflect on other, many other people's point of view. You take them on board. It's it's kind of Arendtian, so I think there's a bit more to be teased out there between what's going on in management today and what Arendt is challenging us from the political realm, as I would put it. Yeah, I mean, Arendt's yeah. idea is that you, you, Sam, you want to respond? You want to say something? Yeah, I just, I think it's important to remember when we're talking about introspection here and, and self-reflective thinking. Arendt does use the word refl reflective, self-reflective thinking in, in her work on Kant um, and her lectures on Kant. Um, but when she's talking about introspection here, she's specifically critiquing the German Tradi the German tradition of Romanticism and the idea of introspection that emerged within Romanticism, which she sees as doing the work of replacing thinking, thinking in a Kantian sense, which she wants to ultimately uphold over the Romantic tradition of introspection, because she sees introspection as denying the plurality of worldly existence by turning experience back against the self and reducing experience to mood, right, as these feelings. And Rahel becomes a figure, a thinking figure, of all of these feelings. And introspection in this way also, in the Romantic tradition, collapses the distinction between private life and public life so that we lose our ability to discern what belongs to the realm of intimacy and what re what belongs to the realm of politics more generally. So I think it's, you know, these two ways of thinking, which Roger has been talking about, and, you know, the Arendt has a, 
an expansive understanding of thinking that she defines in many ways. Um, but here it's introspection and this form of reflective thinking. Um, and, and Arendt's account is defending worldliness in that sense. And, and just to try and answer your question, Connell, I mean, I, again, I don't know business, what the businesses are actually after. Let's just try and understand what Arendt is after, right? Arendt is after um, a, a non-tyrannical, a non-ideological thinking, a thinking that uh, is true to reality. Um, uh, and it's one that is not necessarily useful but is true. Um, if that's what businesses want, I love those businesses, but uh, I, I just, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think that there's some value in a business situation in um, busting through the noise and finding some kernel of what's of reality of what people really want. And to that extent, I can imagine, uh, you know, someone reading our end in the business world and saying, ah, something interesting. But uh, I just don't think the goals are the same, and, and, but I don't know enough it's to say. Little, it's a little different, Roger, in the sense that I work a lot with business executives. And for them, with a small p, the business organization is their public space. Now, I'm playing with words because I'm trying to think through um, the business organization from uh, Hannah Rent's point of view, but it's their public space. And you have to honestly say, aside from the bullshit, it's pretty corrupting of people's moral lives. It's pretty corrupting of who they are. And I see this with people all the time. So I'm using a rent to try and find a way of countering that with people and getting them to talk a language, not a political language as such. You're more political than uh, about a rent than I would be. I'm trying to find a language for people that uh, allows them to counter what is the corrupting space. A public that is. I mean, they spend most of their time at work, have to, pretty yes. much. But this is their public space, not not the world of politics. So yeah, no, I think that's a good point, and and you know, I mean. You, there's certainly something to take from our end in that world, as well as in you know our our daily all of our public spaces, which is to um, try and as much as possible resist the, as Sam was saying, romanticization, internalization, introspection, and um, think world in a worldly way. Um, concretely uh, from as many perspectives as possible. Um, and that's, uh, I think that's something we can all learn a lot from. Can I add one one more thing just to respond to Connell? And Connell, you, you, you're you probably not gonna like this from my, from my reading of Arendt. There's a great note card in her notes for her lectures on Kant where she's um, thinking about this question of imagination and judgment, and it's it's a quippy, so it's easy to memorize. And she says, "The opposite of the beautiful is not the ugly, but the useful, the good for." And what she means by that is that thinking critically, in the way that she talks about critical thinking, as with a lowercase c, um, cannot uh, be directed toward a purpose. It cannot be productive philosophically in terms of concepts or ideas. She sees those as places from which we begin thinking, um, but also more practically in terms of thinking toward an end within a means ends framework. So if you approach the question of reflective thinking in order to, let's say, increase profit margins or make build a more expansive business model, then that's not going to be thinking in the Arendtian sense fundamentally because it's um, a purpose and she's thinking in the context of having purposiveness without a purpose. I take your point, Sam, about that. I have no problem with what you said. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly, which is the struggle I mean. I, just, I, yeah, think, no, I, think, I think Connell is yeah. trying to actually 
think not within a utilitarian framework and talking to yes people. you'll jump too quickly to the in the last point about profit making and the goals and targets kris and all that stuff my yeah. question then we come back to you having done the reflective the, the thinking and all that and so on and not used it in a utilitarian instrumental way okay so what do you do with it mm. so after that well, well, so you, think... you, you, you learn how not to ask that question, because the question should never be, what do you do with it? And thinking isn't something you do and are done Maybe with, the world and then you the take as Maybe the world is the out into the world. It's, it's about disposition for RN. You're... Connell, you know, I, I'll, let me just add in, there's a lot of things you can do with it. Um, and it depends who you are. Uh, artists can try and express that view they have in a work of art. Um, writers can write about it. Uh, politicians can um, act on it. Uh, scientists can, you know, create a new invention uh, or whatever it is. Uh, once you have thought, um, that thought becomes something you have, and depending on yourself and how uh, ambitious you are, you will either try and insert that thought into the world or not, and see if it responds, see if other people respond to it. And if no one responds to but it... But it's never something that you have. I don't know what that means. Fundamentally, in philosophical terms, in the way that Arendt's understanding truth and thinking. Thinking is something that we engage in. It's not productive of something that we possess. And that goes I mean, to her yeah. understanding of Plato as the figure of thinking. We pursue. It's something we pursue. It's never something we have. In nobody that way. said nobody has said it's something we have. So I don't know why that comes up. You just said it's something that we you think it and then you have it. You just said Well I think you think it and then you you can it, it when you think it it becomes something you've thought, and then you act on it. It's not something, it's not otherwise, something you have. Otherwise, Roger, otherwise, Roger, the problem is, uh, it, how to put it, I'm not sure, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So why bother? No, I mean, it clearly has, she it thinks it matters. Thinking, thinking for her impacts our lives. Um, what she says about artists is that the great, the, the you know, artists do Artists have to hide themselves from society, and they have to hide themselves from society because they have to free themselves from the assimilated conformist thoughts of society. They have to have original thoughts. Have them? I don't know. You, they have thoughts. I mean, if you have them, you, I don't know what it means to have them. And then what makes them artists is that they seek to Take those thoughts and reify them, Arendt says, in the human condition. Can I um, ask a question? I've yeah. been trying. This is something you said um, when you introduced the chapter, and there, it's, it's, I can't get. You said that maybe only thinking can keep us in the real world, but then you also said that think, or that she says, Hannah Arendt says, that thinking can create unlimited power isolated from the world. Yeah. So well, these I'm are the. Okay. Those are the two different ideas of thinking that we've been trying to express, right? But Sam, Sam has done it by talking about romantic thinking versus Kantian thinking. Um, and I've been trying to say that there's a tension in Arendt's work where early on in, the, um, in her work on this book and in the origins of totalitarianism, um, there's a strong sense in which thinking has a otherworldly or non-worldly introspective element. And if you look at the chapters in The Human Condition on introspection, um, that's where she most fully develops this idea of thinking, which she thinks has its roots in people like um, Rousseau, but also in Descartes and Hobbes. Uh, and and it's a it's a thinking that um, 
is an escape from the world. Um, there's another idea of thinking, uh, which she begins very much to develop in response to the Eichmann book, but, and I, and I just want to make clear this because it's important in her own work, she already knows about it and writes about it earlier, already in the Crisis and Culture essay in the, in the 50s and in other places, which she does take from Kant, as Sam has been saying, um, which is a thinking that um, stops us from being caught up in ideologies and, uh, and non-worldly introspection and returns us to a plural world through this wider art of thinking through uh, seeking to put ourselves in other people's shoes and imagining ourselves in the world. And so there's two different ideas of thinking um, which will become um, active in Arendt's work. Uh, the one that most people today focus on is the later one, the one that she takes from Kant, thinking as a, as a way of um, uh, countering uh, ideologies and countering fantasies. But I think one of the things that makes Arendt so interesting is that she sees thinking as having two very different and opposed uh, possibilities. It's the same thing, thinking. Different, done differently. And um, what we see in this book on Rahel von Hagen is largely an inquiry into the dangers of introspective thinking. What we see in the Crisis in Culture, the epilogue to the Eichmann book, Life of the Mind, and her lectures on judgment and some other places, is the development of another idea of thinking, a counter tradition of thinking, which she takes from Kant and Socrates and is an attempt to um, actually resist introspection, ideology, and romanticism. And so it's important, I think, to see that these two traditions of thinking are both in her work. Does that, does that help at all? No? <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, you can you can come back if you're if you're uh, if you want to ask more about it. Um, uh, there's a second part of Connell's question about banisters. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm fighting a cold today. Uh, Hannah Arendt's various, if few, references to thinking without banisters are still problematic for me. Are they consistent, or did she move on in how she used the metaphor? Uh, I mean, that's. We'll talk more about that, I think, as we read the, the next book on thinking. Um, but no, I mean, thinking without banisters, uh, she, doesn't, she doesn't actually use that phrase too many times. Um, but uh, it's one that uh, names a very important idea in her work, which is that for most of human history, uh, most people uh, largely are conformist. Not all people, but most people. And they largely act according to moral and ethical and philosophical banisters. Obviously there's exceptions and there's crimes and et cetera, but they usually do. And even when they're not followed, those banisters are still there and people know they're not following them. Um, another word for the, end, the loss of banisters in her work, I think, is the break of tradition, the loss of traditions, the loss of authority. And uh, what all of these say is that we are now living, she would say, the first time in human history in which there simply aren't authorities, there aren't traditions, there aren't banisters. Um, and to the extent we try and resurrect those authorities or those traditions or those banisters, we engage in a kind of dangerous nostalgia. Uh, and so we have to think for ourselves. And um, that's, the, that's the situation we're in. 
There's good parts of it, which is that we're more free than any other people in history. Uh, and yet there's dangerous parts to it, which is that we're more free than any other people in history. And as more free, um, we can do uh, really awful things. Um, can so, I ask one last question, Roger? Yeah. I can stop then. I've interfered too much. Somewhere she says, and I'm trying, just trying to recall it, but she talks about banisters being things that we have forgotten the basis and experience of the concepts. Does, am I right roughly in that, that the the basis and experience of the concepts has been forgotten, so now we have banisters? You're making it sound, yeah. to me anyway, like banisters are kind of a good thing, maybe, whereas I took it from her, they were a bad idea. Well, so banisters, I wouldn't say are good or bad. Uh, they're there. Um, so, you know, a tradition or a banister is are things that are somewhat re rigid, rigid, um, and they emerge out of a, as you said, a fundamental experience that one has. And you know, the experience might be, let's just take a very simple one. Uh, um, the, the 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 holiness of God, right? That was an experience that many people had over many thousands of years, and so you would take your hat off when you walked into a a building, or certainly a church, or, or a temple, or a or, or a mosque, or whatever it was, or you would cover your head if in certain traditions. Um, at some point, that experience becomes simply a, a custom. A rule, and oh God, I'm sorry about this. I don't know why that's happening. Uh, and and people follow it uh, without thinking about it. And uh, that custom, you lose the experience, you lose the meaning of it. But and so on the one hand, you know, you're right. It's sort of a negative. On the other hand, it still holds to it a sense, a meaning that was there from the experience that gives your acts a certain um, ethical content that even though you don't think about it every time you take your hat off, you can think about it and you can come to it. And at least it's a banister or a tradition or a rule that prevents you from doing really bad things at times. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the more we lose the original experience, the weaker the tradition is, the weaker the banister is, and yet the banisters still have some value. The, the point when the banisters maybe become really dangerous is when they've been so completely broken and severed, and yet a bunch of people try and, you know, nail them back or put them up again and enforce them on you, and then you rebel against them, and that can make lead to resentment. Um, but I think that she sees, uh, I mean, I don't think she sees banisters as inherently good or as inherently bad. They're, they're the often uh, faded uh, um, uh, meaningful reification of what were once deeply meaningful experiences. Can I add to that, Roger? Yeah. Um, because I think so banisters for Arendt are concepts in the in the traditional philosophical sense um, in the way that she's approaching the traditional questions and metaphysics like what is the nature of being what is the ground of being what is freedom and when Arendt says that tradition you know that we've lost the tradition that the banisters um, have disappeared she is making a claim on what she understands to be the fundamental experience of her time, which is the phenomenal appearance of totalitarianism. The appearance of totalitarianism in the world broke the tradition of traditional Western philosophy, so that the concepts that we take from Plato and Aristotle about what is the good life and what does it mean to be a person in the world and what is thinking um, are radically changed by the experiences 
that she lived through and the experiences of the 20th century. And so she argues that we need new concepts and categories in order to understand what is happening today. So, just to respond to the question about concepts, if that's helpful. Okay. I, I wonder if, uh, uh, if we don't have different kinds of banisters. I mean, it, in the sense that today, uh, ideology, if you understand it as the lens through which you look at the world, is, is even more diversified. And, and so, uh, we're all walking around with our own set of banisters. And uh, it seems to me that the, that the challenge that we have is a way to uh, uh, articulate uh, those points of views uh, um, in, in a way that other people hear them and push back on them or, or reinforce them or reinterpret them. And so, uh, I think we're in a very good time in the sense that the opportunity is here for us to really get somewhere with the problem that's probably been around for over 100,000 years of what does it mean to be a human being and live a human life? And uh, it's very different today, but I th and perhaps more challenging and more complex, but it's exactly uh the fact that we're we're free from all insisting that we all have the same banister that we're we're all taking off our hat or we're all putting our hat on uh maybe today we can put on a scarf or lift up our thumb or do whatever it is but uh i think the banisters are there i think that's that's a good point howard and all i'll say to it is um rn is always uh, in my view, um, vacillating in a very interesting way between seeing the loss of banisters as a tragedy and as a, a great opportunity. Um, uh, if you read the uh, last paragraph of her essay on what is authoritarianism, or what is authority, I'm sorry, what is authority, uh, um, you know, that's what she says. She says, you know, well, okay, I've just spent the last 40 pages telling you authority is dead and authority is lost. And yet this is a great opportunity for us to um, potentially find new ways of, to live together and find new uh, ways to, to, to form new authorities or new, or, or new, new ways of being together. Um, and yet she will also say, uh, well, the fact is that right now we have so many different ways of people seeing the world and so many different banisters that are out there broken that people follow uh, that we live in a kind of rubble heap, she says, in the concept of history, uh, of fallen pillars. And uh, amidst all those fallen pillars, um, there's a kind of despair and meaninglessness and there's an enormous desire to escape that a kind of loneliness a feeling of abandonment and there's an <laughs> enormous desire to escape that and that is the um opening experience for totalitarianism and not only totalitarianism but any kind of uh totalizing uh ideology that will take you away from the world so um you know, I, 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 I think uh, she sees the danger in it and she sees the possibility in it. And a lot of it is how we will view it. Let me uh, move on to B's question. Uh, how does Arendt's early thinking in Rahel Varnag and especially related to active parven, parvenuhood, I love that, active parvenuhood and assimilation, relate to her later thinking on the human condition on the Vita Activa. Uh, B, are you, are you talking about the Vita Activa sections on introspection that, we're ta that I was mentioning, or, or what do you mean, her later thinking on uh, the Vita Activa? 
Are you here, B, or not? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Ah. Yes, I hear you. Okay. I was more reflecting on uh, perhaps the wider uh, implications of Rahal Verhagen uh, and Arendt's uh, foreshadowing or foregrounding her thinking on Beta Activa and other things. So, for example, I was just reminded about uh, animal labour and with regard to, I think it was Connell's point about the application of Arendtian thinking, and in, in his case, it was introspection. In terms of the corporate or the business, and of course, the corporate term is very carnivorous, very much um, laboring for profit. So, I was, just, I was just looking at the connection between early thinking in a more generic way, rather than just on introspection, in Verhagen or Rahal Verhagen, and her, her thinking and her developing of those conceptualizations in the human condition was particular reference for me. Uh, on Vita Activa. I'm not sure if I'm making any connections, but it just struck me as quite, quite an interesting link uh, to her later thinking. Right. So I'm, um, I mean, I, w I was trying to draw some of that out, and I mean, yeah. I, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by the Vita Activa because the last section of the human condition is called the Vita Activa and the Modern Age. Um, and so I thought that's what you were referring to, but now I hear you talking about labor. Um, so uh, it was threw me off a little bit, but so I'll start with the Vita Activa in the Modern Age, which is the part of the book that I think is most related to the Von Hagen, because it is the rise of the Modern Age, uh, and with the Modern Age, um, the turn uh, away from the world, which he calls world alienation, uh, to the self. Um, and now, uh, again, Kant is for her, her, Kant's idea of thinking is not romantic, and yet Kant himself turns away from the things in themselves and towards the thing as it, the object of experience, which is one of the steps and one of the, uh, ideas that she talks about in the Vita Activa of how thinking leads and the enlightenment leads away from the world and alienates us from the world and moves us ever more to ourselves. I mean, one of the really brilliant insights of that book is that she says that the rise of secularization does not lead to a worldliness, but actually leads to a radical subjectivism where we in turn through idealism in which we um, alienate ourselves from the world. And so it's in those chapters on the Vita Activa in the Modern Age where she um, develops this whole reading of uh, world alienation, part of which is um, introspection. Um, on the question of labor, uh, I'm not as clear off the top of my head uh, what the connection between Rahel von Hagen and her reading of labor would be, um, but I'm not sure if you had particular something in mind about labor. No, I didn't actually. I probably uh, conflated two ideas. One was the one you answered, and uh, maybe think a bit more about the Vita Activa in the uh, modern age. And thank you for that. That was really helpful. And the reference to laboring work and um, uh, action. And you talked a bit about revelation uh, today. Was really I was reminded of what Carl had said about the notion of this cycle, recycling and cycling, uh, cyclical, I should say, uh, notions of labouring in the kind of corporate sphere. So that's probably why I probably myself confused uh, those two thoughts. But that's fine. Thank you. I won't take you any more time. Okay. Thank you. Um. Any other? Okay. Any other comments or thoughts on that? So Daphna writes, this book is different and oddly more confusing to me than some of her more intricate thinking later. Uh, well, it's also younger and uh, it's, it's not yet fully developed, but okay, good. Perhaps because her presentation of, <coughs> excuse me, of Rahel Von Hagen is inconsistent. She disapproves of Rahel and yet concentrates on her struggles of Jew, uh, struggles of Jewish and identity as something worth discussing. Would it be too 
can't read this word. Fake? Fake to assume that her facile. study... Facile. Is facile. Too facile to assume that her study of Rahel Von Hagen is really Hannah Arendt's coming to terms with the dilemma of being a Jew, and yet, as she says later, not loving her people as she should, according to the Jewish community. All right, well, this is, this is a great question, and it's also a question that leads into some of the conversations I was hoping uh, we might get to uh, today about assimilation more generally. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I think just about what RN's view of Rahel is, I think it's complicated, but I think clearly she is uh, enamored with Rahel in many ways. Uh, she thinks that Rahel made a great error, right? Which is the error of seeking to escape being Jewish. But that something in her prevented her from uh, carrying that error to completion. And that she was one of the, she was someone who just couldn't think in that romantic, introspective um, way of denying the world and denying her Jewishness. And that that part of Rahel, that she was such a you know, powerful thinker who sought to escape Jewishness, and yet she wouldn't let herself succeed in some way, is, and that tension is, I think, what fascinates Arendt about Rahel. Um, then the second part of your question, right, which is, well, you know, is this autobiographical? Is this about Arendt? You know, I, I, I don't know. I'll start right there. I, I, but I do think it's uh, Arendt very much opposing uh, the assimilationist argument uh, that was a widespread argument uh, in Germany and um, is certainly a, a widespread, has been at times a widespread argument in the United States and elsewhere uh, that that what Jews should do is assimilate um, and Arendt uh, becomes a real critic of uh, the assimilationist thesis. Um, not, and I think the way she the the way she criticized it is is unique is fairly is quite unique and as a result one that I think would actually enrich a lot of discussions about assimilation in all different areas of uh, the world, but has largely been ignored because of perceived problems with our end based on other things she's written like her let's say on Little Rock or the Eichmann book or other things. Um, and so I think it's worth trying to tease out um, her views on assimilation um, to the extent one, one can here. Uh, one thing we can say is that she clearly thinks that to assimilate into a racist or anti-Semitic society is to be a scoundrel. So I think we, we, we know her views on, on that. Um, and she thinks that assimilation has incredible costs, not only to society, but to the person assimilating. Um, the main cost is that uh, as you assimilate uh, and you separate yourself from Jews, um, you yet remain a Jew, and thus you have a kind of, you, you, you come to see yourself as possessed of a personal uh, defect um, or an advantage, you know, your, your, your intelligence or your greediness or whatever it is, and, and that these things um, uh, are, are dangerous to you as a person because they prevent you from being who you are. They give you this sense of a, of a, of a stereotypical character that you have internalized, you have to internalize. So she sees great dangers in assimilation, uh, which also raises questions of what she wants instead. Um, but anyway, um, does that help? Is this the beginning, Daphne? Maybe this is a place where I can open it up 
uh, and let some of you talk a little bit about uh, um, what I you think took it's, from her. I think it's interesting because Hannah Arendt herself comes from an assimilated background. Um, the fact that she studies Kant and that she writes about the various Christian thinkers that she did before she wrote her philosophical political texts means that she comes from a background that allowed her to do that because of the fact that she comes from such an assimilated background. Um, and there's passages where, or references in Varnhagen, in Rachel Varnhagen, where Rachel travels to Breslau and meets with her Orthodox Jewish dark Jews, the ones that, and they're described in very derogatory terms. So I think it's 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 a little bit um, kind of important to understand Rachel's distaste for assimilation since she's basically distasteful of the things that allowed her to accomplish as much as she did. Um, and the other Arendt thing that, or Rahel? Arendt, Arendt yeah. herself. I mean, Arendt had no choice. She was born to this and she grew up as an assimilated Jew who went to university, God forbid. And the other thing that was interesting to me is <coughs> As you can see in the Eichmann book um, and the reaction of, Rach, of Hannah Arendt to Israel is that she becomes to some extent a pariah of her own society later. So I find that this book, which is so oddly different from all of her later books, is, is basically really a Hannah Arendt, I think it's Hannah Arendt's struggle rather than Rachel Varnhagen, of whom I don't get a very good grasp. I'm not sure who Varnhagen really is. I mean, I know she wrote these letters and she had these salons, but I have very little understanding of her. And maybe it's because of time and place, but it's, it's, it's fascinating. I thought this was a fascinating excursion. So thank you for that. So I just wanna say, two things in response and let others respond as well. One is, I think it's questionable whether we can call Arendt assimilated. And uh, you say she grew up in an assimilated house. She doesn't think so. Um, she grew up in a non-religious house. And, 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 and allow me at least to try and make this distinction. I, I haven't, I haven't, this is not something I've spent a huge amount of time thinking about, but it's a distinction that I've played with over time. She would say, I think, I will say for her, because she's not here, that she grew up in a non-religious house, but one that took being Jewish seriously. And um, her family never denied being Jewish or ran away from being Jewish or, or, or diminished the fact that they were Jewish. Um, and so, uh, on one level, uh, from her, as I understand her reading, that's a household that's non-religious, but not assimilated. I think what she would say is Judaism was not a huge factor in her life, although she always was Jewish, until anti-Semitism made it a factor in her life. At which point she said that her maxim and her mother's maxim was, if you're attacked as a Jew, defend yourself as a Jew. And her mother always told her, she said, that if anyone ever says anything, you stand up and you come home and you tell me and I'll deal with it. Um, so I don't, I, I, so I, I don't know, I'd love to hear if you, you know, if you accept this distinction between non-religious and uh, um, versus assimilated. Uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to take up too much time, but I just want to say that my father was born in Berlin in the same year as Hannah Arendt and grew up in an exactly the same kind of household. And he always considered himself an assimilated Jew. And he was very surprised to find that he was suddenly considered Jewish. He left Germany in 1933, so maybe to some extent he had a, a bit of an advantage but he grew up in what he perceived to be an assimilated house. So I, I don't know if I totally accept you. I hate to say this to you, yeah. Roger. 
Well, you don't have to well, accept it. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I think that's how she, I think that's a distinction she would make. Although I don't ever remember her making it explicitly, but I don't think she saw herself as an assimilated Jew. Roger, I wanted to say. Um, Go ahead, Susan. Well, just that, I mean, she went to university, uh, seemed to have no problem going off and, and functioning in that culture. So to me, you have to be quite assimilated to do that. And the other thing which I've mentioned before in terms of her total uh, lack of attention on Rahel as a woman, uh, I would say Hannah Arendt was completely assimilated as a woman uh, operating in a very male world in which she did everything she could to deflect any attention whatsoever on her being a woman. So if we're talking about assimilation in other ways other than as a Jew, I would say she was totally assimilated as a woman and never wanted any uh, discussion or attention on that. Roger, I, I think this raises the question, uh, the obvious question, which uh, I think plagues a lot of people today, which is, what do you mean by a Jew? What is a Jew? Uh, because no, I, I, everybody's smiling, I think. <laughs> but, but really, uh, I, I take this very seriously in her case, because here is a person of great intellect, and she becomes a philosopher of a kind and a, and, and a scholar. But you don't see any Talmud in her in her in her uh, in her work. You don't see her pursuing Jewish philosophy and Jewish theory. You see her pursuing, if you if you like, world. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to talk about the assimilated world, this kind of assimilated, non non specific uh, philosophy, which actually has its base. And she's she's quoting Greeks. She's quoting Kant. These people are not Jews, right? So it's uh, so there is a way there is a way in which she is born of a culture that is not Jewish, and she's carrying forward a culture that is not Jewish in its essence. And that's I mean that's the thing I think the first thing that you can say the first thing that you see about her her claim, honest though it may be, her claim to be Jewish. Because there is this way in which he is clearly assimilated, an assimilated person. And, that's, and that has to do with the foundation of her thinking. The foundation of her thinking does not reflect her Jewish background at all, not at all. Now, that takes us to the present day, because we're in a situation today where the, just exactly as in Varnhagen, as in the book, where uh, this uh, the scene in Breslau, where there is... The, the dark Jews and the other, that, that exists today as well. And within the Jewish community, there is tremendous difference in definition of what it is to be Jewish. There are people who are Jewish who are denied access to the state of Israel because they're not Jewish enough, right? There, there, are, defin, there are religious definitions that define my daughter, three quarters Jewish, as non-Jewish because the line went through a, a, a Christian woman, right? So there, I mean, there are many different ways in which Jews are defined, even by Jews. So that to to try to understand today what is a Jew to do with the anti-Semitism that is growing, right? What is a person who is Jewish to do with that? Well, obviously, we have that lesson from Hannah Arendt, which is attacked as a Jew, defend yourself as a Jew. That's clear, but exactly how that gets played out is not entirely clear because of this internal struggle within the Jewish community as to what it is that constitutes Jewishness. And it's something, it's a struggle I think that Jews today of, of every kind are struggling with in some way, even those who are assimilated and not dealing with it at all. There's just that, that's the way in which they're struggling with it by, by, by turning away. End of rant. Yeah, I, I Roger, can I ask? Can I ask <laughs> what you um, what do you see? What do you see as the benefit of making the claim that Arendt's not an assimilated Jew? And and just for fun, there's a great anecdote in Elizabeth Young Rules for the Love of the World about her childhood. Her parents 
um, weren't religious, but her grandparents were, and they came from a very well-established Jewish family um, in Königsberg, and Arendt went to synagogue every weekend with them. Um, she also attended Sunday school during the week, which was mandatory, mandated by the German state for all um, kindergarten school children at the time. And there's a great story where when she was like five or six, young girl says she went up to the rabbi after services and says, don't you know prayers are only to be directed to Jesus? <laughs> um, and I think she, you know, she just had this, or she had from an early age an education in in both traditions and i think we see it in her writing but i'm wondering what you think we get roger from making that the claim that she is not an assimilated jew well i mean on a biographical level i'm not sure you get very much i mean you can argue about it i, I think if you want to understand her opposition to assimilation, which I think is a real in her work, um, one obvious, which she never really, you know, I, we can, I think one of the interesting things in her work is to actually try and tease out what she means by her opposition to assimilation. And one reference point would be how she lived. Right. Um, and uh, if you say, well, she was an assimilated Jew, then it's not very then it's not very helpful to uh, tease out um, what she means by her opposition to assimilation. But I actually think that, you know, when she opposed when she writes the Little Rock essay and and she says. In a way that she later took back for, for other reasons, but that it was a mistake um, for the parents to sort of force their kids to become, to go to integrated schools uh, when they weren't wanted. And she's like, why do you want to be part of a society that doesn't want you? Um, I actually take that to be an important, another important reference point in her understanding of what does it mean to not live as an assimilated person in a, in a dominant society. So I look at her and I say, okay, I'm Hannah Arendt. And as Jack says, uh, I largely... You admit it, it, finally! No, I, I'm, I, this is, no. Sam knows I don't like ever say, speaking for Hannah Arendt. I'm just saying, <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 as the head of the Hannah Arendt Center, I try and be very careful of not putting words in her mouth. But, you know, I'm, you know Jack says Hannah Arendt, you know, went to university. And Susan says Hannah Arendt largely denied being a woman. Um, okay, but let's look at her Jewishness. I don't know, you know, we could count up all the pages she wrote, but I would bet that at least a quarter of all the pages she wrote are about Jewish questions. I mean, you know, and the first, you know, from the age of 25 to the age of 40, Zionism, Israel, Jewish questions were at the very forefront of Hannah Arendt's work. So the fact that she writes about Kant and she studied with Heidegger uh, and writes about Plato, uh, yeah, she didn't find Jewish philosophy uh, to be, you know, the most meaningful for her. But she, did she, praise, she did praise Buber and Rosenzweig for their translation of the, of, the, of the Hebrew Bible, and she was interested in what they had to say. But I agree with you that I think that her... Um, her background is an assimilation. We're, we're dealing with a semantic concept because she was born and grew up in an assimilated environment, which allowed her to do the things that she did. But the question of assimilation was one philosophically that she didn't agree with. And maybe that's where you and well, I differ in our view, because I think that she wanted people to be able to stand up for what they were rather than to accept totally what they're told that they should be i think but but you know so let, let let me just try and be as brief and clear as i can because i haven't like i said i haven't fully thought this thing through but what it matters for me is that i take her to be saying assimilation means denying yourself and that you should never deny yourself. 
and um, you, but there are different ways you can be a Jew. This goes to Jack's point. By the way, there are different ways you can be an African American or a black or you know or or a Muslim. I mean, we're at huge debates about what is a Muslim today, and is it assimilationist to you know go to college if you're a Muslim or a Jew or black? I mean, you know, and 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 her point is that's not assimilation. You can be a non-religious Jew. You you can be a non-religious Muslim. You can be, uh, you know, whatever, however you want to put it. And so what I, what I find interesting is if you take her seriously in her opposition to assimilation and then you look at her life, you can actually see somebody who's trying to live a life in which she's trying to be who she is. Now, she, you know, she's once asked, who are you? And she says, I'm basically a student of German philosophy and German poetry and the German language. That's who she saw herself as. But she says, in some of my life, I'm a Jew. And in some of my life, I'm this. And I refuse simply to be one of these things. And I refuse to assimilate to whichever one I have to be. So I take, the reason I think it's important to make this distinction that I made between a non-religious Jew and assimilation, and this is to answer Sam's question as clearly as I can, is because I think Arendt is actually offering us a model of what it lives means to live as a non-assimilated Jew. As someone who lives as who they are in all their different sides. And that's what I think um, she endeavors to do. And, and actually, um, uh, without, without opposing you, Paul, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Howard, did you want to speak? Uh, I, just, I just wanted to say very yeah. quickly that, that I, I think that this book really reveals the struggle that we see through her entire life. This is a er very early example because she hasn't yet come to terms with it. She's a, in fact, as we know, there's a very big difference between the end of the book, which was written later, and the, then the, the beginning of the book. And in between, Jews were treated very differently. Right? So and that's a very important thing to remember. So, um, so I, you know, I'm very familiar with the stuff that she wrote that's very Jewish, which is the, when she first came to this country. Uh, a lot of the stuff that she wrote was really for that refugee co community, the Jewish refugee community, and it was addressed to them, and it came out of them, and she was part of that community, very sure, very definitely Jewish. I'm not denying her Jewishness. I, I, I have to assert that my view is that she never resolved that issue. Never, she, it was an issue that, I, 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 see, I see your point, Roger, and maybe that's the best way to look at it is that she lived her life as she could, and you don't resolve your issues. You don't resolve issues in your life, you just live it. I think that's the point that you're trying to make. And maybe I'm looking for a resolution that I have no right to ask for. But, but the reason I'm looking for that resolution is because in, in the current times, we are confronted with this upsurge of antisemitism, and we need to know how to deal with it. And it's very, it's very complex because Jews are all over the place around it. And that's the reason I raise it in that way. I, 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 there's no question that I admire Hannah Arendt, otherwise I wouldn't be here, right? <laughs> we have five minutes or so left. Does anyone else want to offer uh, anything? Roger? Else? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think you made a very important point on Jack, too. Uh, and when I read a rent, I, I read a little differently than most of the people here. I'm always reading her and thinking of, well, what does it mean to me today? And uh, uh, and today it's not only anti-Semitism, it's a rise in xenophobia of all types. And so this question of identity, I think it deserves more than the five minutes, of, or the 10 minutes that we've spent uh, before this. Uh, Jack and, and you both made the point, do any of us, any of us really think we know who we are? Aren't we constantly struggling with who we are? And then what about the way other people see you? Well, you're, you're sen sensitive to that too. And what about the stereotypes that you're supposed to be, but you're not? And then what about the fact that you're a human being? And what is the relationship of 
this identity issue to being human. Uh, and that feeds into the human rights and the way they're described. It. It's a, an extremely complex subject and it's worthy, I think, of us spending some time on it in the future. Great. Lawrence wants to say something. Lawrence, do you want to join it? Jump in. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I live, was raised in New York City, and uh, my parents were immigrant Sicilians. And um, I've grown up amongst uh, a very large Jewish population. I mean, think about it. New York City, and um, I grew up in the 60s. I'd like to say that there is a relationship amongst the uh, immigrant groups uh, of that era. Uh, it appears the um, Sicilians and the Italians sort of got along with the Jews, uh, lived next door to one another, rode the subways together. I didn't inter intermarry so much, although there was some around the fringe. But um, there is a, a working um, tolerance and um, in, in some respects, uh, respect for one another, which allowed the community to, uh, communities plural, to flourish and get along. Um, you know, what the Jewish question, what is a Jew? Um, it's a little outside my field of expertise, but uh, my wife converted to Judaism about 12 years ago. And I have traveled to Israel on two occasions, one in 1973 and one in uh, 2002. So that's what I wanted to say. I read the book, uh, it was very stimulating, um, really hard. Uh, I understand the struggle uh, that Aaron goes through uh, identity, self-definition, and these are these are issues which um, all groups uh, struggle with. Um, do you erase your Sicilian heritage because you were born in Brooklyn? Um, you know, the, the, these um, are inter inter ethnic. Uh, problems and issues. Thank you. Roger, you should unmute. We can't hear you. I apologize. Start uh, over. I'll start over. I want to thank Lawrence for what he said. I said, and I think, uh, the issue, the reason I find some of this material so fascinating is precisely because I think the debates we have around assimilation, whether it's Jewish assimilation or Arab assimilation or black assimilation, women's assimilation, as Susan brought up, are so remarkably impoverished in the modern period. It's all about, are you a sellout? You know, or are you, you know, uh, or or are you like, you know, on the other side? It, it's it's a one, it's 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 one. It's you're either this or that, pariah or parvenu. And you can read our end as saying this or that, pariah or parvenu, but I don't think uh, that's the most interesting way to read her. I think you read someone like a biography or whatever they call this of Rahel Varnhagen, and yeah, you're, someone said it, I think Daphna, you don't learn a whole lot about Rahel Von Hagen, but you learn a lot about what does it mean to want to escape being a Jew? What does it mean to want to escape being black in the 21st century? Or being a woman at some point? And what are the pitfalls of that? And and how does one, does one then just say, I'm, I am a Jew, or I am black, or I am a woman? Or how does one compose a life? And what I think is fascinating is you rarely ever that I know of 
get a factual account of one person, one woman, who struggled really valiantly to assimilate and yet couldn't and didn't. And you get someone like Hannah Arendt commenting on that struggle and the limits of it. Um, I think there's a lot we can learn uh, about the assimilation question, uh, which is a very living question for Sicilians and for Arabs and for Jews and for blacks and for women and for gays and for everything. Um, from from Hannah Arendt's work that, uh, and I think it's largely been ignored uh, in that world for a host of uh, reasons. So um, that would be my one hope is that some people will pick this work up. Um, I'm very excited that we're gonna start. Yeah, go ahead. Someone wanna say something? Or not? Sam, what's the, when's, when's the, when does the next reading group start? Can you remind so us? So we are, we are beginning the life of the mine on June 7th. Um, and then if the, if you go to the webpage for the VRG at hack.bar.edu slash membership slash VRG, you can get a 20% off discount code for the life of the mine online through the local bookstore here if you want to order it um, or if you're in the area um, you can go to Oblong um, and we will be beginning with the introduction um, on the world's phenomenal nature and the difference between true being and mere appearance. So um, just a couple things uh, I, I'll actually be teaching the life of the mind in Italy this summer so that will be fun and uh, We'll, we'll have that to look forward to. You can all come to Italy and take the course if you want. Yep. Um, uh, we also, um, two of my colleagues at Bard, or one of my colleagues at Bard and one former colleague are actually working on the new edition of The Life of the Mind. And maybe we'll be able to convince them to, at some point, join us and uh, give us some of their wisdom. Uh, this is a, a great book. We'll say more about it on June 7th. Uh, it's the last book she started and never finished, and um, uh, it should be very exciting to to read it. And it's all about, the first section is all about thinking. So uh, for many of you, it will be a continuation uh, of some of the conversations we've been having here about thinking. So I look forward to reading it with you, uh, Sam and I, and uh, enjoy the rest of your May, yes. and we'll reconvene in June. I hope you continue to read, enjoy reading Hannah Arendt. Thanks very much.